Tonight on Game Points 367, Microsoft accidentally leaks years of its own plans to the public through the FTC. We have some studio layoffs, unfortunately, a couple games coming into an end. And of course, the update on that Unity kerfuffle that has been going on. All that and more, but first I want everyone to know this is an audience and active podcast. So if you're watching us live at twitch.tv slash game points or later over at any video hosting platform, feel free to join the conversation. I want to know what you guys have to say about these topics. Let's go ahead and get right into the very first story here, and that's the fact that Microsoft, well, they fucked up. <laughs> they accidentally uploaded an unredacted document talking about the next few years, all the way up to 2028, of what they have planned with their gaming division. All of this is, of course, related to the Activision buyout and their dealings with the FTC. They're supposed to upload a document to the FTC for some reason, uh, legal matters. I don't want to go off into a topic I don't know too well much about. But apparently what they accidentally did was put up publicly a whole mess of their past email communications, what they were going to do, things that they were thinking of buying, game release schedule, details on their next console. It is a whole mess that is happening right now. Right here you see an article from Bloomberg uh, Archive because, well, fuck paywalls. All these links will be provided down below. By the way, I recommend you go take a look at them yourselves. Microsoft Corp. mistakenly uploaded confidential information about its video game operations to a federal court website, according to a person familiar with the matter in a post from a Federal Trade Commission employee. By the way, to be clear, it was not the FTC that let this go. It was a Microsoft employee that screwed up. Uh, And, of course, before anyone realized what was happening, this thing was downloaded multiple times. The entirety of the document is out there if you want to take a look at it. It has since been taken down from the FTC site. But the internet is forever. Going on back to the article. The FTC was not responsible for updating Microsoft plans for its games and wrote consoles to the court website the FTC Director of Public Affairs wrote on X, formerly known as Twitter. The documents uploaded on Monday are exhibits from the FTC's antitrust suit to stop Microsoft from completing its $69 billion takeover of game giant Activision Blizzard. They contain proprietary information about Microsoft's plan for a refreshed Xbox console, upcoming unannounced video games, and older discussions around purchasing Nintendo, among others, by the way. Uh, Phil Spencer was quick to kind of, well, I don't want to say quick, but he did come out earlier today to talk about this, saying the following on X. We've seen the conversation around the old emails and documents. It is hard to see our team's work shared in this because so much has changed and there is so much to be excited about right now and in the future. We will share the real plans when we are ready. So this is essentially Phil Spencer coming out saying, hey, this is all old stuff. A lot of these plans aren't even in existence anymore. Things change over time. You will see that some of this stuff is dated as far back as 2020. So a lot can happen in three years. We had a little thing called the lockdowns that kind of derailed the entire industry as well, too. So what I'm about to go over could still be in development. Might have been long canceled. Could have changed. Could be ongoing. We don't know. But it is interesting to take a look at it because it's going to give us kind of a glimpse behind the curtain that we rarely get to see with any of these major companies. Uh, As an aside, I'd have to imagine people are getting fired for this. Because a fuck-up of this scale cannot go unpunished. Uh, If I was Phil Spencer, I would be demanding heads. And if I was... uh, What's the head of of Microsoft? Satay? Satay? I would would be looking very closely at Phil Spencer going, what the hell is going on? Because this opens yourself up to all kinds of havoc, which we'll get into as we go on. I'm going to go over some of the highlights that we found from this leak, by the way. Some of them are going to be coming from Reset Era. Some of them are just posted to Imager. Once again, all these links will be down below. First up, the entirety of Bethesda's release schedule going all the way up to the fiscal year end of 2024. Now, this starts at 2020, so you can imagine that this document's already three years out of date, and of course, things have changed, but some of the stuff stayed on track. Starting up here with Doom Eternal and its DLC, that would be the uh, Doom Eternal and Ancient Gods 1 and 2. Let me bring this up on my end so I can have a little bit easier time actually reading this here. There we go. And then some free-to-play mobile stuff. This is all stuff we know so far. Doom Eternal, Elder Scrolls, Fallout Wastelanders, Deathloop. We know this. 2021, they expected Starfield to drop. That would eventually be delayed another two years. 
online Elder Scrolls Online expansion, Redfall, also delayed another two years. That pandemic really did screw up of a lot of plans, didn't it? Ghostwire Tokyo, Project Hibiki. I don't know what Project Hibiki is, and I've tried looking it up, but no one seems to know. You also have them dipping into Project Ubu and Project Wanderer, both free-to-play slash mobile titles. Uh, the closest thing I've been able to find on Hibiki is that Bethesda has been working on some kind of open-world game for the past four years that no one knows anything about, really. It's possibly that. Given its, its name, it could also be set in some kind of Japanese setting, maybe. And we'll see. Hibiki, by the way, an excellent whiskey from Suntory. They expected the Indiana Jones game to release in 2022. We know about that Indiana Jones game, but this is where we start getting some interesting details. Oblivion Remaster. Really? So the rumors are true. There have been rumors that Oblivion was going to be remastered. I think I'd prefer a Morrowind remaster myself, but Oblivion's probably easier to go back through. It's just I, I know Oblivion better through the, fate, the, the fog of history. Uh, Morrowind is the more clouded one, and it would be near impossible to go back to remaster Daggerfall or even just the original Elder Scrolls. They're also expected to launch some Starfield DLC and another Elder Scrolls Online expansion. In 2023, Doom Year Zero in DLC. What the hell's Doom Year Zero? You have to assume it's some kind of prequel of that, possibly dealing with the first breach into hell through the Mars Gate, maybe showing the origins of the uh, Doom Slayer that you play as, who was, I believe, just a regular Marine caught up in the events before the gate opened. Remember, Doom, uh, Doom and Doom Eternal, the 2016 Doom and its sequel, are sequels to Doom 64. I think 64. I think that's the one they canonically said it was. So it could be a retelling of the original Doom. They're just calling it Doom Year Zero since, well, Doom has been taken. I would love to see that, especially with all the extra narrative things they've thrown in on there. I think Doom does an excellent job with its narrative, saying so much while saying so little. Project Kestrel, whatever the hell that is, another mystery code that I was unable to find up. Actually, I think Kestrel was the open world one in Hibiki. We don't know. I don't know. A little fuzzy on the details of what these code names are. And Project Platinum, anyone's guess. And then by 2024, now keep in mind this calendar has been blown all the hell at this point, but Starfield just came out, and that was supposed to come out in 2021, according to this. You're going to have The Elder Scrolls VI, Project Kestrel's expansion, whatever that's going to be. That's probably the open world game now that I think about it. Some licensed IP game, but it's not Indiana Jones because it's already listed on there. Fallout 3 remaster. Another rumor that's been kicking around for a while, considering that you have In Exile and Obsidian both under the same house again. Essentially the team that made the original Fallout. More Elder Scrolls Online expansion. A Ghostwire Tokyo sequel. Interesting. I didn't expect to see that on here. I didn't think Ghostwire Tokyo did all that well. I would like to see a sequel to it. Dishonored 3. Oh God, yes, please. And Doom Year Zero DLC. They're probably going to be doing much like the Ancient Gods 1 and 2 for Doom Eternal. Something similar to that, I'd imagine. Now, clearly, this release schedule has been blown all to hell. Who knows what's been canceled? Who knows what's still in progress? Who knows what's almost about to be released? We have no clue. Things could have been added, taken away, and all of this would have been before Activision Blizzard, uh, before that deal was made public. So, who knows if this is true or not. But it's an interesting look at what might have been coming up. We'll go ahead and move on to some Game Pass day and date details. This is another one of those behind the curtain things that I find fascinating because it lets us know a little bit as to what was going to be offered to certain studios to get their games on Game Pass. Uh, we're going to skip a lot of this stuff right here. This is not, not something that we really, really need to worry about. It's a very long email chain. Uh, there are details about how Phil Spencer realizes there's a bit of a, like an 18 month gap and they really need to start doubling down on day and date releases. An 18 month gap between uh, major Xbox releases, I should say. And they're looking to fill that with Xbox Game Pass. But what someone did was make a chart on games that might be great for Game Pass and how much they would be willing to spend to get them over there. 
as well as risk assessments and whether or not they believe this is actually going to happen or if it's like a low risk or high risk situation. It is interesting to see what they're willing to pay for some of this stuff. So for example, right up here, they were trying to get Lego Star Wars and they were offering $35 million to have it day and date on Game Pass. Day and date plus 180. So what I believe that would mean is they get it on launch day and it gets to stay up there for six months, I'd imagine. But that kind of had a low to medium likelihood of closing factor. This is, their, this is the chance of it actually happening and how much of a wow factor that would be. I'm assuming that's their esoteric calculation of how impressed the public would be. Lego Star Wars, 35 million, same thing on there again. It's funny too that you can see on here the wild cards. Uh, PC Tech, oh, it's uh, Lego Star Wars, sorry, Lego Star Wars again. But they talk about wild cards, things like how Warner Brothers and Discovery currently are going through some upper management issues. Uh, Warner Brothers Games is even up for sale. Uh, you'll, we'll get into more of that in a second. And just random market feature that they are smart enough to go looking around at, hey, this could go through and get blown up by these random things. They offered Dying Techland. They offered $50 million for tech, uh, Dying Light 2. Sounds somewhat reasonable to me. City Skylines 2 from Paradox. They were exploring the idea of exclusive de debuting Skylines 2 in a closed beta. Uh, this was the inking on this deal was already done. They're talking about doing other things with it. So Skylines 2 was already coming to Game Pass day and date. Can we do something else with it? This is something that caught the internet kind of by surprise. Red, or it just says RDR2, but we know what that is. Red Dead Redemption 2. Day and date for ninth generation. That was originally supposed to come in the fiscal year of 2023, second quarter. Once again, pandemic fucked a lot of plans. I think they accidentally just leaked that there's a next gen version of Red Dead Redemption 2 coming. Now, of I mean, at the end of the day, of course there is. Take Two loves making these goddamn things. Remasters and selling the game over and over and over again. Uh, a little bit like Bethesda and Skyrim, how people just keep buying it, so they're going to keep making it. But good, interesting to know that there seems to be a Generation 9, meaning current gen, Red Dead Redemption 2 on the way. Things from Bandai Namco, Ubisoft's Just Dance. They wanted Just Dance day and date for $5 million. It actually had a medium to high chance of going through. I don't know what Hub is, maybe Hubbub, Hubbub Plus, like Light Talk, I, I don't know. But given Ubisoft's financial woes even back then, even two or three years ago, I get the feeling that Microsoft was lowballing them for that because Just Dance is a huge franchise. But Ubisoft's hemorrhaging money and they were even back when this document first dropped, so I wouldn't be surprised if they figured that they can get away with being so cheap with it. Same with Return to Monkey Island. Couple of other things. Uh, Baldur's Gate 3, they try to get day and date. Interesting, where it says second run Stadia PC RPG. Remember, that's not to say that it's a bad game and they look at it down uh, unfavorably. That's to say that it was going to be on Stadia first. They're thinking maybe when it comes out to everything else, it can drop on Xbox first as well. And they expected $5 million to get day and date on Xbox. Probably a good idea that Larian seemingly turned them down on that one with how successful that game has been. Uh, Gotham Knights, 50 million. Uh, AC Rift, this is now what Assassin's Creed Mirage is. That one being one of the, one of Ubisoft's bigger games they're asking for $100 million on. Funny though, when you look at the wild cards, it's a 1.5 version of Assassin's Creed also, more Ubi, as in, do they really want more Ubisoft on Game Pass to overrepresent that company or not? So that's one of those things to look at. It's like, we already have a lot of Ubisoft stuff coming on here. Do we really want more? Uh, Suicide Squad, a $250 million offer or expected ask to get that day and date on Game Pass. Expected to come out March 31st, 2023. Uh, very low chance of, of coming through. Something they mentioned, though, too. They're already in partnership with another competitor for WB. They're already in partnership with someone else. Most likely can't offer us rights-wise. What that other competitor may be, you'd have to imagine Sony, right? It's not Nintendo. They also said it would be multiples of, of back-for-blood price. Change of guard at Discovery makes sell-in motion new. 
So that's why they're getting this $250 million partner ask is because they've probably asked around about it and they would say it would be many, many times more than whatever Back for Blood's day one game pass would be. Jedi Survivor, uh, expanded partner, partner ask $300 million. Uh, wild cards, crown jewel, they won't do. They're just completely dismissing that out the case. And later in the email, they even say that the rate of investment for getting that is probably far too low to even consider doing it. Same with Mortal Kombat next, $250 million. Crown Jewel won't do. It, it's, uh, it's just too big of a game. There's no way they're going to limit themselves like that. Take two for Grand Theft Auto V, already out there, but they're still <laughs> expecting to ask 12 to $15 million for it for a game that's over 10 years old at this point. And then two more minor titles from Focus Home Entertainment and Skybound, which I, I have no idea what those are at all. It says Blood Runner is the sequel to Snow Runner. I know what Snow Runner is, but I don't know anything about Blood Runner. And then this, this last one right here, Net Crisis Glitch Busters, I have no idea. But interesting look and how much they're willing to pay and who they're willing to pay to to get games day and date, which is what D&D means, on Game Pass. Just, just a fascinating look behind the curtain. We also potentially got our first image of Microsoft's handheld. I know it's blurry. Bear with me. This was in one of the leaked document pages, though. As they talk about future of consoles, you're going to see different controllers, the core, the premium, the elite. It looks like a keyboard where my head slightly will move slightly out of the way so you can kind of see it there. Uh, the two consoles, unmistakably the Xbox Series S and X, cloud devices, streaming sticks and top boxes. I'd imagine like Amazon, the, the Amazon Fire Sticks, the Microsoft equivalent of that. We're going to touch on that a little bit more in the future too, in this show as well. But right here, this handheld, it really does look a little bit like a Steam Deck or probably more closely a Switch. I would imagine that this... All that is, is someone mocked up a Switch with Xbox buttons on there. Don't take this as the final design at all. It's probably just a placeholder art to say, hey, we have a handheld coming. Uh, interesting to know that they are working on something, though. And that's going to tie into a little bit of news later as well. We have Phil Spencer here <clears throat> as we go to this email talking about some of the things he wanted to buy. Let me uh, bring it up so I can read it as well. We're not necessarily going to be looking at the uh, bulk of this letter, but I want to talk about this paragraph right here, starting with confidentially. Confidentially, we have two fairly active merger and acquisitions discussing in gaming right now. Keep in mind, this was back in 2020. Warner Brothers Interactive and ZeniMax. They eventually did buy ZeniMax. That's Bethesda. I took ZeniMax to the board, uh, board of Directors last week, and prior to the Board of Directors discussion, I asked Amy and Sataya, who are the CEO and CFO of Microsoft, uh, Sataya being the CEO, Amy, I think her name is Amy, Amy something, uh, but she's the C, Amy Booth, I think, maybe, I don't remember her name, but she's the CFO. If they wanted me to show either or both of these games, given the TikTok discussions, and if they both empathetically told me no, they are doing fine if all three of these deals make sense. I won't say WB or Zenny is Nintendo, but both are for sale and gettable by for us if things align. This is after he was waxy poetic about picking up Nintendo, by the way, saying that it would make sense for them both. It's just that Nintendo sits on a giant pile of cash, making any kind of merger nearly impossible. The biggest obstacle in WB is the IP ownership, which we would not own any of the IP, which hurts long-term flexibility, and the only obstacle from Zenny valuation expectations of the founders. So they're essentially, they're, yeah. they were saying, or rather Phil Spencer was saying, the WB deal, we can buy that, right, right. That shouldn't be a problem. It's just we're not going to own any of the IP, which is the most valuable part of that deal, that being the DC catalog and Harry Potter. You just wouldn't own those. And any, any deal... My, uh, WB would still own that. Any deal with the games would be dependent on having at least some kind of exclusive rights to that IP, I'd imagine. Whereas the ZeniMax deal, well, it's just convincing the board of directors that they can make money off of it. Apparently, Phil Spencer did convince them and they gave that the go-ahead. I think it's likely that one or both of these happen, which will help us continue to double down on our gaming relevance. 
to give a sense of scale, ZeniMax is about the size of our current first party studio organization, so that'll be doubling our content asset. Downside is more core, less broad, not mobile, more North American, European, etc. So he's essentially saying we get twice as many games, but they're going to be very similar to what we have already. We're not really expanding our footprint anywhere. We're just doubling up our offerings. We're not dipping into mobile gaming. We're not breaking out into the Japanese or Chinese or Southeast Asian markets, not even the South American market at all. It's just kind of giving us more of what we're already good at. Finishing off here. I love this discussion and value looking at the opportunities here. At some point, getting Nintendo would be a career moment and honestly believe a good move for both companies. It's just taken a long time for Nintendo to see their future exists off their own hardware. A long time. It was a little smiley face at the end there. Uh, he's not necessarily wrong. I think that Nintendo could make a lot more money if they abandoned their hardware and became solely a game maker. Because no one necessarily buys the Switch because it's a powerful piece of hardware. It's not. They buy it for the convenience of being a handheld. That can be replicated elsewhere. What people gravitate to Nintendo for is its software. Is Mario. Is Mario Party. Uh, Legend of Zelda. The Pokemon. Animal Crossing. That is where people go to Nintendo for. Phil Spencer's not wrong in that account, in my opinion. But... To tie up to that first paragraph, which I only skimmed over very briefly, Nintendo has a massive war chest of just available cash. Their valuation is in pure raw dollars. It's not, they, they have a lot of stock and of course holdings and all that, but they have a massive li liquidity store. So they're not hard up for cash, means they're not necessarily willing to sell, let alone to Microsoft. But you throw enough money at anyone, and they will, of course, buckle. Like I said, a bunch of just fascinating little stories from this leak that we're getting here. We have an idea of what their expected growth revenue is all the way up to 2030. Now, I'm not going to get into details necessarily of what the numbers are in here, but one thing I want to take a look at real quick is that advertising. I don't, I don't like that. So, in 2014... Their, the bulk of their money was made from hardware transactions, uh, essentially the console, PC, and cloud software sales, and subscriptions. The next year, hardware, or in 2022, hardware dropped. The transaction side of things went up, the software side of things, and then the subscription side of things doubled or even tripled, it looks like. They're projecting that by 2030, those numbers are going to grow even significantly more. But look at the top. 1.4 billion in advertising and 2.6 billion in mobile transactions. Now, mobile transactions make sense. Every company is also trying to get into mobile games as they're starting to cap out in the console space. There's way too much money still to be left on the table in mobile gaming. That's just the fact of the matter is, is that you can make a lot of money with doing very little output on mobile games. Sure, you're going to release 10 games and nine of them are going to suck, but all you really need is that one to be a success, and it, it does gangbusters typically. So I get the alert there. What's this 1.4 billion in advertising? Where is that coming from? Are you going to be advertising in games? Are games going to start having advertisements popping up? Are they talking about advertising from their mobile games? Because sometimes mobile games have the uh, free-to-play version, but you have to sit through some ads. Maybe their streaming service. Maybe there'll be a basic tier that's cheaper per month or per year, but has ads before you start up any game. Maybe they have a free-to-play option. I don't know. But that really bothers me because I think of Hulu and how Hulu used to be pay and you didn't get ads. Now it's pay and you get ads. So once Microsoft, by 2030, I can imagine that they're sitting back thinking that their subscription services are going to lock everyone in and they're going to be able to finally go, that's it, we beat all of our competition. Start introducing ads. Uh, and I, I don't see anything positive for the fact that they're expecting to make $1.4 billion in, ad, in advertising on Xbox. Uh, that, I think, is something to be very concerned about for the future. But I'm just speculating at this point. One more thing that I want to mention from this massive FT, uh, uh, fuck up that Microsoft did. 
we have an idea of what they want with their next generation of hardware. Nothing, no, no, no real big details or anything like that. But as of quarter one, 2023, it seems like they're shooting for these stats right here. An ARM 64 versus X64 Zen C. Uh, balance of big and little CPU cores. Like I said, they're not really getting into the details. These are just spitballing kind of what they're, they're like a wish list almost. Not going to get too deep into most of that stuff down there. They'll talk about ray tracing and, and stuff that you all know. That last line right there, thin OS. Lacking thin OS for sub $99 consumer or handheld devices. They got to be talking about the Microsoft game equivalent of an Amazon Fire Stick, right? Something you stream from. Uh, Microsoft investing very heavily into cloud streaming technology. I'd imagine that this would be something probably for 60 or 70 bucks. No bigger than a little stick like a Fire Stick plug into your TV. Hooked right to other servers lets you play games. With a subscription to Game Pass, of course. Maybe even a small offering of free-to-play stuff. You can also put in things like you find on an Amazon Fire Stick, Hulu, uh, YouTube, etc. Microsoft seems to not want to be competing with Sony. They seem to be wanting to be competing with Google and Amazon. The other big boys. And if you take a look at their stock and their market cap share, that's the more the level that Microsoft is on. If Microsoft wanted to, they could just crush Sony overnight because of how big they are. I'm not, I'm not talking from a gaming perspective. Put down the console war pitchforks. But when it comes to sheer raw numbers, the fact of the matter is Microsoft is significantly, as a whole, is significantly larger than Sony. And they could just gobble them if they want to. Microsoft's competition is Apple, Amazon, Google, even Facebook to a degree. That is where they, or Meta, that is where they have their sites and goals set on. And I think Microsoft wants a piece of the Amazon Fire Stick market. I, I, I absolutely believe that is what they're talking about down there. And I would fully expect to see that roll out within the next year or two. I think this is going to happen way sooner than you might think. Well, that kind of wraps things up for the Microsoft side of things. Let me know what you guys think down below. I'm curious to see if any of these little tidbits that dropped have an interest to you, what you think they might mean. Once again, I am sure that a lot of this stuff has been canceled over the past year. Some of these documents are back from 2020. But it's still a fascinating look behind the scenes. It's something we rarely get to ever, ever see. Uh, and, and it kind of lets you see what Phil Spencer's vision for Microsoft is after all. I mean, the man's talking about buying Nintendo, for God's sakes. So the sky is the limit when it comes to what, whatever he has planned. And I think he can do a lot of it. And I know a lot of people are saying there's no way that Nintendo would ever sell to Microsoft. Same situation as Sony. If Microsoft, if Microsoft as a whole, as an entire company, wanted to buy Nintendo, they could do it. Uh, that email earlier, by the way, talks about how it even floats the idea of a hostile takeover, although admittedly dismisses it almost instantly. So they can do it. They absolutely can do it. And it would not, I don't think, be that hard for them to do it outside of legal boundaries, legal restrictions like the FTC saying, no, you can't do that one. We have a few updates on other stories I want to get into. First up right here. We're going to talk about Unity and the fact that they came out... Uh, yesterday and said we fucked up to a degree the statement here from unity we have heard you and we apologize for confusion and angst the runtime fee policy we announced on tuesday caused we are listening and taking our talking to our team members community customers and partners and we'll be making changes to the policy we will show an update in a couple of days thank you for your honest and critical feedback here's the thing there's no confusion here and they're very clear about what they were wanting to do the confusion was coming from the fact that it seemed to be out of nowhere and it seemed almost borderline illegal <laughs> what they were doing. But Unity very, very clearly said what they were going to do. And that there was no confusion. Now, apparently some behind, the behind doors deals have been going on. There's some ideas of what's going on. This is another article from Bloomberg, link provided down below, that talks a little bit about what might be happening. Though keep in mind these plans are still in flux. But it seems that Unity is thinking of changing some things, but for the most part, this is still going to be happening to the article from Bloomberg. 
Video game toolmaker Unity Software said Monday it's backtracking on major aspects of a controversial new price hike, telling staff in an all-hands meeting that is now considering changes including a cap on potential fees, meaning there wasn't one to begin with. Under the tentative new plan, Unity will limit fees to 4% of a game's revenue for customers making over $1 million, and that installations continued toward reaching the threshold won't be retroactive, according to the recording of the meeting reviewed by Bloomberg. Last week, CEO John Vercatello delayed an all-hands meeting on the price changes and closed two offices after the company received what it said was a credible death threat. Uh, don't, don't call in death threats, please. It's a, it's a scrub move. The company apologized to customers on Sunday and said it would be making charging changes to the pricing policy. Yes, but we don't know what those changes are. We have a hint of what they could be, though. Mark Witten, a Unity executive, said the company hasn't announced the latest changes because the executives are still running them by partners and don't want to repeat last week's communication debacle, which led to several clarifications. One of the most controversial elements of the policy concerned how Unity would track installations of its software. Remember, the original idea was, hey, it's a proprietary thing that we use, so we're not going to tell you what it is, just trust us. Which, fuck off, we don't trust you. Although the company first said it would use proprietary tools, Witten said on Monday management would rely on users to self-report the data, which is just as pointless. So then we're going to go, yeah, we didn't sell anything. We gave them all away. Were, those were all charity bunders. Like, are you fucking kidding me? Just get rid of it. It's, it's, it just get rid. Uh, John Marcatello, by the way, infamous for his tenure at EA when it was voted worst company in America, uh, beating out things like Comcast. And also infamous for saying things like if game developers aren't building their games, microtransactions involved, they're fucking idiots. Uh, that's almost a direct quote, by the way. He's just an unsavory character and uh, seems to continuously fall upwards. It'll be interesting to see if Unity ever recovers from this. Their stock has gone down hard over the past few days. Admittedly, it was already a bad few quarters for them to begin with, but it tanked real bad on this news and the ensuing firestorm that followed. Going back to last week's topic from Deadline here, SAG actor President Fran Dressel urges members to approve strike authorization against video game companies. Uh, essentially, exactly what I said that was probably going to happen is starting to happen. Where SAG Africa's President Fran Drescher, that's right, the nanny, said that right now is the time to show our solidarity, urging her members to authorize a strike against the video game industry. The Guild, which has been on strike against the film and TV industry since July 14th, could go on strike against the game companies any time after September 25th when the voting on the strike authorization ends. The, first, the, first, the Guild's first and only strike against the game companies lasted 183 days back in 2016 and 2017. Regardless if the Voice Actors Guild can come to an amicable agreement with the video game IP industry, sag uh, is still going to be pressuring to go on strike because they want that extra power to push on the industry as a whole because a lot of these places are intertwined with each other. Sony. For example, they're not just a game maker. They make movies, TV shows, etc. Warner Brothers, same case. So the more power they can gather, the more they can kind of collectively hold demands over these studios' heads. I get it. It's a smart move. Uh, we'll see how it shakes out. I get the distinct feeling that they probably will go on strike because SAG after is a very powerful union and the pressure on high has to be tremendous to the actors involved in it. One thing to keep a note though, and this is one of the reasons why Drew Barrymore and Bill Maher have been causing such a, a hubbub in the news lately, this doesn't do anything for the production team. This is for the actors and the writers. So the poor fucking cameraman, he's screwed. They can go on strike for, for three years and then finally get some kind of deal. He gets nothing. This is one of those things that the reason why they kind of tried to resume production without writers or actors or anything like that is because they do have people who need to eat and they need to work. And yes, I understand some of their complaints, but I also understand that there's a lot of people who, even if they have all their complaints addressed, will get nothing other than missing six months to a year worth of work. So as far as I'm concerned, 
let them feed on each other. Uh, I, I have no love for a lot of these big uh, publishers and developers, or, nor do I have any love for the movie studios that tend to be rather exploitive. But I also have very little empathy for a lot of the actors out there as well. Voice actor is a little bit different because I do know a few of them and they tend to be a smaller scale. But when someone makes $100 million a film going online telling me how they're not making enough and how they're concerned about a job, eh, it kind of rings a little hollow. It's one of those unfortunate cases where the face of your movement is insufferable, whereas the people who actually comprise of your movement are starving. They need to do a better job of presenting it. But that's going off on a tangent that has nothing to do with this specific, that has nothing to do with gaming, I should say. When it comes to the voice actors, though, I do expect them to go on strike, at probably even when, when the strike uh, of midnight hits on the 25th. Something to keep an eye out for. If that is the case, we will be talking about it next week. I have two little bits of information to wrap things up with, and they're both rather unfortunate. First of all, Ascendant Studios, the makers of the recently released Immortals of Avium, announced that they are roughly going to be laying off about 40% of their staff. Uh, Immortals of Avium was a massive bomb, unfortunately, which is sad because the game itself is quite decent, and if it were released any other year, it would have at least been able to make its money back, in my opinion. I think this is a case of EA sending yet another game out to die because they fucking stacked it up against Starfield and Baldur's Gate 3, for God's sake. There was no real good time to release that this year. In my opinion, they should have pulled a Dying Light, too, a dying light with it where they release it like in January or even December when nothing else is coming out. But instead, they sent it off to die, and Ascendant Studios is paying the price of that decision with about half that staff gone. A better, a better result than I expected, to be quite honest with you. I thought they were just going to close that studio down, although that is a lot of time and effort to close down a studio, to build up a studio only to shut them down after one game. I did think it was on the cards. So the fact that they're still around, we'll see. They still might shut them down a little bit later or fold them into another studio. But yeah, the Immortals of Avium clearly did not do well. We also have Evil Dead the Game winding down production. They're not going to be making any, new more, any more new content for it. They'll be keeping the servers on for the foreseeable future, but I'd imagine with the next couple months we'll also get a final date on when they're pulling the plug on that too. Evil Dead the Game, one of those asymmetrical co-op games where you have a bunch of people against one other player. Think like Dead by Daylight being the perfect example for this. Cool and premise. There are so many of them out there right now, though, and it is going to be near impossible to stay afloat if you're not already established like Dead by Daylight. Best of luck to everyone involved in both uh, Saber and Ascendant Studios. I know that that sucks, and I know that it feels like every week goes by and I mention yet another studio closing or laying off people or games getting shuttered, but thus is the nature of the beast at the moment. And if you work... <clears throat> excuse me. Talk for 40 minutes. Throat's getting a little dry. If you work for any of these places, I hope you land on your feet soon. And that kind of does it for the news, which means that does it for the show as well. This has been Game Points episode 367, and thank you all for dropping by. I do stream this show every Tuesday at 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time right here at Twitch TV slash Game Points. If you can't watch us live, you can watch us over at any myriad of video hosting platforms, be it YouTube, Rebel, BitChute, etc. You can follow myself on X at CapitalistPig21, and you can join our Discord server, link provided down there somewhere, along with all the stories we talked about today. I highly encourage you to read them yourself. And of course, if you like what you see here, you know what to do. Like, spits, follow, sub, shares, all that good stuff. You're on the internet. You know what streamers want. Until next week, I'm out of here. <laughs>